The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant, TEPCO, has released new videos of the facility. Footage taken on May 6 shows the remaining damage from the tsunami and workers' activities. A clip shows dents in a tank that supplies water to a reactor suppression pool. An overturned car is lying nearby. Another video shows an oil tank that was swept away by tsunami and landed near the plant's headquarters, about 500 meters from the number one reactor. Many windows of this building are broken, and documents are scattered around an office. The damage is believed to have been caused by hydrogen explosions in the early stages of the nuclear crisis. Other footage shows workers closing a dormitory door to prevent radioactive substances from entering. It shows them measuring radiation levels on their protective clothing. Another video features a vehicle spraying green agents that prevent the dispersal of radioactive materials. A different clip shows hoses being used to inject water into reactors. The orange one is for reactor 1, the yellow one for reactor 2, and the green one for reactor 3. Three kilometers from the city, the Vladimir Ilyich Lenin nuclear power plant, where several thousand people go to work each day. Tonight, the 176 employees of Block 4 have been ordered to carry out a test on a self-fueling system of the reactor, something that could save energy. At 1.23 a.m., the security systems are deactivated and the experiment begins. A series of detonations go off in the core of the reactor. While Pripyat sleeps peacefully, the floor of the plant begins to tremble. The 1,200-ton cover of the reactor suddenly blasts into the air. An ultra-powerful stream of radioactive vapor releases uranium and graphite over hundreds of meters around the plant. From the gaping hole, a spray of fire charged with radioactive particles in fusion shoots a thousand meters into the sky. There were a lot of colors, and they were really bright, orange, red, sky blue, colors like blood, a rainbow. It was beautiful. <laughs> the most serious nuclear accident in history has just taken place. During the night, early in the morning, I got the call around 5 a.m. I was told there's been some accident at the Chernobyl nuclear plant. The first firemen on the scene battled the fire without the adequate protective gear. They poured tons of water on this strange fire, but nothing seems capable of putting it out. They are all exposed to lethal doses of radiation. Two men die that night. 28 more will follow in the next few months. They are the first victims of Chernobyl. Nobody was prepared for such a crisis. For the next seven months, 500,000 men will wage hand-to-hand -hand combat with an invisible enemy. A ruthless battle that has gone unsung, which claimed thousands of unnamed and now almost forgotten heroes. Yet, it is thanks to these men that the worst was avoided. A second explosion, ten times more powerful than Hiroshima, which would have wiped out half of Europe. This was kept secret for 20 years by the Soviets and the West alike. Many of these images have never been seen before. They were taken by journalists who were also exposed to nuclear contamination, some of whom later died. Those images tell the story of a hidden war, whose consequences continue 20 years later to worsen the toll of the disaster. This is the true story of the Battle of Chernobyl. By early morning, the clouds are already being contaminated by the radioactive column rising 1,000 meters into the sky. Igor Kostin was a photographer with the news agency Novosti. When a friend and helicopter pilot phones him that morning to offer to fly him over Chernobyl, 
All Costi knows is that something has happened at the plant during the night. He is the first journalist to witness the gate When we got close to block four and circled around it, I had no idea of the risk. When we flew over the block, I opened the window of the helicopter. I didn't realize then what a big mistake that was. The thin, translucent smoke he sees rising from the ruins is in fact highly radioactive. Kostin is one of the few Chernobyl reporters on the scene in the early hours of the accident to have survived serious exposure to radiation. When I opened the window, I couldn't hear a thing. The ruins of the reactor were below me. I felt like I was floating in space, like in a tomb, a real dead silence. I couldn't even hear the helicopter anymore, nothing, a black hole, a tomb and deathly silence. This is the first picture ever taken of the breach. All my equipment jumped after a minute. I couldn't understand what was going on. I thought my batteries were dead. I only managed to take a dozen photos. Once I returned to Kyiv, I processed my pictures and I noticed the negatives were black and the colors very poor. I didn't know it yet, but the photos had been exposed to radioactivity. At the core of the blown out reactor and buried under 14 meters of rubble, the graphite surrounding the nuclear fuel burns and melts the uranium. The radioactive fallout is going to be a hundred times greater than the combined power of the two atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the Kremlin, eight hours after the explosion, Gorbachev only has scant information on the situation. The first information consisted of accident and fire. Not a word about an explosion. At first I was told there hadn't been an explosion. The consequences of such false information were particularly dramatic. For Pripyat's 43,000 inhabitants, life goes on as usual. They know nothing of the disaster three kilometers away. The information we got was that everything was sound, including the reactor. When I asked the academician Alexandrov, he told me the reactor was absolutely safe. It could even be set up on a red square. It wouldn't be any different than a samovar, like putting a kettle on red square. There are rumors in the town of a fire at the plant and deaths in the night, but no official information has been released. The white flashes on these images are the results of radioactivity on the film. People in the streets hardly blink an eye at the masked soldiers scattered throughout the city. Colonel Grebenyuk led the troops in charge of controlling the situation. There was a metallic taste in our mouth, an acidity. They say radiation has no taste. It was only later we realized it was the taste of radioactive iodine. While children are still out playing in the squares, 
Colonel Grebenuk's men spend the day taking the first readings of radioactivity in the city. In those days, radioactivity was measured in units called ronjons. Normal atmospheric level is about 12 millionths of a ronjon. In Pripyat, by early afternoon, readings are already over 200 thousandths of a ronjon. In other words, 15,000 times higher than usual. By the evening, the level has shot up to 600,000 times above normal. Boulevard Lenin, 200. Boulevard Ukraina, 250 milli ranjans. And that night, seven ranjans. My subordinates were starting to wonder if the machines were working properly or was someone lying to us. We did not know that the reactor was still burning and radiation was still spreading. This map is sealed in plastic because it's still radioactive. It's thought that a human being can absorb up to two ronjons per year without being affected. But the body is lethally contaminated if it receives over 400 ronjons. During that first day, the inhabitants absorb over 50 times what is considered to be a harmless dose. Such a pace, they would have received a lethal dose in four days. To understand what is going on, the colonel sends a patrol to take the first readings at the base of the plant. Their first readings were recorded on this map, 2080 Ranjans. I was worried about my subordinates. How could I send them in there? At these astronomical levels, 15 minutes is all it takes for a human being to absorb a lethal dose of radiation. At the Nuclear Institute, the figures provoke a shock. Such a level of radioactivity has never been seen before. Gorbachev hurriedly creates a governmental commission made up of the country's top experts in nuclear energy. This is led by the academician Legasov, a nuclear physicist of international renown. He immediately leaves for Chernobyl at the head of a scientific delegation. We hoped they would be able to evaluate the situation quickly, but for the first couple days, they weren't able to tell us anything. It was a dramatic situation. We'd be in session, waiting for information. We were demanding information, but they weren't able to tell us anything. 20 hours after the explosion, the level of radioactivity continues to climb. By now, windows and doors should be sealed and iodine tablets swallowed to counteract the effects of radioactivity. Yet no such orders have been given. Despite rising tensions in the city, the population has still not been informed of the situation. Yulia Marchenko was only five at the time. She lived in Pripyat with her family. Her father worked at the plant. My parents took me to the daycare center, like usual. Everything was absolutely normal. My father already knew there'd been an accident, but no precautions had been taken yet. 30 hours after the explosion, the first security measures are enforced. More than 1,000 buses have arrived. At 2 p.m., the army announces the city is to be completely evacuated. I remember the teachers at the kindergarten gave us iodine pills. Then parents came to pick up their kids. Everyone was running around, but they weren't panicking. We thought we were only going to be gone for three days. 